So now we've done some PCR and we need to do electrophoresis. Electrophoresis uh, allows us to estimate the size of the band and also see if there's any PCR uh, product in our reactions. For 310 you'll always use these mid-range gel forms. All we need to do is put a comb. So these are the combs across the, the top. You know, the combs have teeth and uh, they fit down into the slots that have been etched out of these plexiglass molds. Conceptually what's going to happen is that we'll put this, submerge this underwater once we have a gel made. The DNA is negatively charged. We'll put the cation on this side and the, um, and the anion on this side. The DNA then, once the gel has been formed, we pull the comb out and there'll be holes along inside the gel. We'll put the DNA in there in a buffer that's actually heavier than the, the than water. It has some glycerol mixed with it. So it sinks to the bottom of those holes and then we'll apply a charge. And once the DNA is in those holes, it'll move to the cation, right? Because the DNA is negative, so negative will go to positive. And it'll move through the gel. And as it goes through, the smaller fragments will move quicker than the, than the larger fragments and will separate the DNA fragments based on size. The anion, the negative charge, has got to be on the side that the DNA is on. The cation has got to be here because the negative charge will go towards the positive end of the, the gel box. Black is, is represents the negative charge and red represents the positive charge. Making a gel is much like making jello. Um, essentially it is a, a, uh, a branch sugar, auger is. When you put it in, in water and boil it, you let it cool, it'll form cross -link, a cross-linking structure. And that's what the DNA is moving through. But we're going to have to dam up these sides here, so just like a jello pan, right? So that we have somewhere so the jello doesn't leak out. And if, if the gel happens to leak out, it can cause a big mess. There's a couple different ways to do this. Just grab your, your gel mold, and as you can see, it has two sides missing. So it's not actually a complete mold. You can't pour your gel into this and expect it to not flow everywhere. So one method is to take these rubber gaskets. Um, this should be in a drawer labeled box gaskets right here. So you just take one of these and you can put it into the grooves at the end of the box. It should just fit right in there. Um, and so you do that for both sides using two of these. What you can do is you go over to a gel box and you stick it in this way so that the sides of the, the gel rig actually form the other side of the, of the mold. And the rubber creates a seal and then you can just pour your gel in this way and let it set. And the problem with this method is that there aren't always gel boxes available. The easiest way um, that I personally use is tape. What you want to do is grab a comb, one labeled combs, uh, obviously. Um, these green ones are labeled PWS310, so you're going to want to use these ones. They have the, um, the finer tooth combs uh, for multiple wells. You have a lot of samples. You generally want to use the fatter ones because you, don't, you won't have that many. Um, so just place the comb like so in the box. So we just measured that gel and coincidentally be 100 milliliters. So in this case, for that size gel, we just need one gram. Okay, so now pouring out this uh, powder, simply tap on the edge as little bits, and just doesn't take much to get a gram. All right, so we went over it a little bit. That'll be fine. Okay, now we making the gel for the first time. It'll boil, it'll often boil quite vigorously, and so we need. A, a flask that's going to be at least twice the size in volume. So we need at least a 250 milliliter flask or perhaps something even larger. 
Um, the larger it is, the quicker it'll cool. This is a 500 milliliter flask. And also the quicker it'll boil because it has more surface area there. So I'm adding in the agaros first. Okay. Now these way boats, we don't bother washing time and again because they're always used for agaros. Nothing else really is weighed on the scale anyway. So um, now we need 100 milliliters of uh, TBE. This is that 5x concentration of TBE. It stands for a Tris Borate EDTA buffer. This is not what you want to put in your uh, gel boxes. This is a 5x version of it, so it's a concentrate. We need to dilute this 1 to 10 to have a 0.5x TBE. So we can, often there is another jug here at 0.5x TBE, but if that's not the case, all we need to do is uh, measure out how much we need. Now we have 100 milliliters of, of 0.5x TBE. Pour this in with our gel. Okay. Give it a little mix so that the concentrate mixes with the water and the agarose. Okay. For this we need about, let's do a minute. Like I said, the first time agarose is melted like this or is put into solution, it boils rather vigorously. Now while this is going, I've got a minute, I'm going to rinse this out with water, stick it over on the drying rack, um, and uh, not leave it sitting around for someone else to clean. Let me check it. Not quite. That's okay. Not boiling. That's what I mean. So these gloves are some hot, like hot pads, right? All I'm going to do is give it a shake and get that so you can see some of the some of the agaros is stuck on the bottom of the glass. So I'm just going to loosen that up, get that back into solution by swirling. Don't drop the flask if you do this on your own. It's it's warm. It should boil here the next the next few seconds. Okay. Another swirl. And there is some agaros powder or granules along the sides, and so I'm just swirling it to try and get those all into solution. We do want to have a 1% gel after all. I'm holding onto the flask pretty hard, actually, or pretty tightly, because I don't want it's, it is slippery with this glove. So we'll go for another, oh, I don't know, 20 seconds. It doesn't have to go much. We don't want to boil it too much because we want to keep the same volume, right? We calculated out uh, six centimeters or a 0.6 centimeter thickness. If we get down to five, that's that's okay. But below five, um, you do start to run into to uh, issues of just not having enough DNA in the gel to visualize with ethidium bromide. Um, 0.5 is conservative. I've seen thinner gels, but. Um, 0.5 will work just fine too, but I usually have a target between 0.6 and 0.8. Okay, so now this is uh, 100 milliliters of gel, and we need to add some ethidium bromide. So the ethidium bromide is here up on the shelf. Now notice the concentration, it's at 10 micrograms per mil. If you read in the Cold Spring Harbor manuals that we've referred to in the past, You'll notice that they uh, they refer to 10 milligrams per mil is usually their stock concentration, and in general you want to have a 0.5 micrograms per mil per per gel within the gel, right? So 0.5 micrograms. That means adding in in our case 100 microliters of this solution. We're going to add about 40 of this into our gel, and we'll get nice nice staining with the feeding bromide. So first I want to get, you've noticed I haven't been using gloves, you don't need gloves for any of this part until now, because um, anything touching the thidium bromide is, is uh, you don't want any parts of your skin touching thidium bromide. Thidium bromide is a known carcinogen, it, it's a dye that intercalates between the two strands of DNA in the minor groove, 
and uh, it, it does so in the gel and it also do it to your DNA. Supposedly it also concentrates in the gonads of, of uh, organisms, so it's better not to deal with that. And in fact, many of these equipment over here have athenium bromide, at least traces of it on it, and it's always a good idea to wear gloves while you're working here as well as a lab coat. So these pipettes we use always for ethidium bromide. It's this one's set for 20 microliters. Okay, these fit the yellow tips. And then one, I want 40. There's two. That's 40. There's a little bit left on there. I'll just tip it so that it gets in the gel. Now these don't have an eject button, these pipetters, so just put it here. There is a trash can for ethidium bromide tips only, and anything contaminated with ethidium bromide goes in this uh, trash can. Okay, now I need to make sure I screw the lid back on tight for the ethidium bromide. Now I'll swirl it. Not to try to avoid not breathing in the steam at this point, right? Is some methidium bromide will volatilize with the water. This is our gel. We have the mold ready. We simply need to pour it in here and let it cool. But before we do, we need just to let this let this cool a little bit further. You want to get this so that it is warm. At least you can hold your hand to it. Pour it too hot, what happens is it ends up warping the glue between the parts of the plexiglass mold. And actually it's really hard on the, on the mold and causes it to warp. And you'll notice that I'm swirling. The only reason you want to keep it moving is because often, if you let it sit for too long, it'll start forming a, a skin on it, just like gravy. When that skin gets moved and clumped up when you pour it, it ends up leaving lumps in the gel, and you don't want that to happen. If it does happen, it's not lethal. You simply move the lumps down with your fingers while the gel is still fingers or with some tips like this, and maneuver those lumps down towards the bottom because in our case, we're only going to use the top gel. Alright, we're there. Now you just you don't want to plop it in, you want to put it in nice and smooth, okay, so there's no bubbles. And I'm pouring it in just slowly here. I'm doing by the comb first, because that's the most important area of the gel. And then I'm going down towards the bottom. If any skin were on the top, it would come out last. And as it hardens, it'll turn to an opaque solid. So now before this really cools, let's put some water in here and uh, dilute down any of the unhardened agar rubs. And it saves a fair amount of work for cleaning because then I don't have to get a brush and scrape out any remaining agar rubs. If you do let it cool, and it's you that made the gel in here, it's your responsibility to get a, a brush and scrape it out and make sure it's clean. Don't put it back on the counter with gel bits inside. 